The opinions expressed on this program represent the viewpoints of individual authors or contributors and do not necessarily reflect those of Troy University. Hello and welcome to eConversations. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Sutter of the Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. The U.S. is a nation of laws, and laws require lawyers to write contracts, resolve disputes, and conduct court proceedings. America, in fact, has over 1.2 million licensed lawyers. All of these lawyers need training in the law, which is a task for the about 250 law schools that we have across the nation. And these law schools graduate more than 35,000 new lawyers each year. Decisions made about the law school curriculum affect our lives through the cost and the availability of lawyers to help manage our affairs and write our contracts. The American Bar Association plays an enormous role in legal education through a process known as accreditation. But is the impact of all of this beneficial or may the, may the ABA be artificially increasing the cost of law school? Joining me on eConversations today to talk about this aspect of legal education is Dr. Alan Mendehall who is the Associate Dean of the Jones School of Law at Faulkner University. Alan holds a PhD in English from Auburn University and law degrees from West Virginia and Temple Universities. In addition, Alan's the Executive Director of the Blackstone and Burke Center for Law and Liberty at Faulkner University. Well, welcome to the show, Alan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for having me. Well, before we get into our topic for today, I wanted to give you a chance a little bit to talk about this uh, the Center for Blackstone and Burke uh, Center at Faulkner University, which was recently created. So they think it's a very exciting uh, center, right? It is. It's a very exciting center. So the Blackstone and Burke Center for Law and Liberty is a research and educational institute that focuses on the uh, common law tradition and American mm -hmm. constitutionalism. And we examine the norms and nurture the institutions of ordered liberty. So we focus on things like economic freedom, religious liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, all those ancient liberties that are passed down and the Anglo-American legal tradition and uh, that we have inherited and in some in some cases still have preserved in at least residual mm -hmm. form. And that's really important because I mean I think the common law really is like the law of liberty, the law of a, or, or, a voluntary ordered society, right? It is. The common law tradition represents that bottom-up system of ordering uh, from which uh, we derive rules. So the idea being that uh, rules emanate from the people, from the mores and traditions that exist that are pre-political, pre that are before mm -hmm. government promulgation. And, and so I think the center is helping to play a, a valuable part in bringing this back into the, the legal education. Today. I like to think so. I like to think so. Well, that, that gets us to our, our main topic for today, which is some other elements of, of legal education. Uh, and related to this, we're going to get a number of topics today, including accreditation and uh, professional licensing of lawyers. But it's, to begin with, it's, it's the American Bar Association, which maybe we, all of us are familiar with the term the ABA or, or, or familiar with this at, at some level, but we maybe don't know a lot about the details of it. The ABA is, is behind a lot of this. And you've recently written some pieces that were critical of some of the roles, yeah. of the, some of the effects of ABA uh, on legal education. So if you could, just for a preview, what are some of, the, uh, some of the, what you see as some of the problems here? Well, sure. I'm happy to, to state some of those. I think the main problem with the accreditation regulations that the ABA implements is that they force law schools to reallocate resources toward all these expensive things, keeping technology, which takes the form of, say, computer labs. You'll see a lot of law schools with big computer labs and computers that nobody uses. Um, they, uh, there are regulations that restrict the type of work that faculty members can do so that faculty can't go out and take paid positions with uh, law firms or businesses so the faculty can become distanced from the actual everyday quotidian practices of real life lawyers. So there is a tendency for law professors to grow aloof over time. Um, but I think the most important the most important thing the ABA does is it accredits law schools. And uh, if you look at Milton Freeman's Capitalism and, and Freedom in the chapter on occupational licensure, he actually takes on the AMA, the American Medical Association, mm -hmm. and its 
accreditation authority over the medical profession. And I think there's a case to be made that it's more important to protect the consumer in the medical profession than it is in the legal profession, protecting the consumer being the justification or the rationale that's always given for why we have these barriers to entry, why we have occupational licensure, why mm -hmm. we have certification, why we require people to go to law schools and these kinds of things. And, uh, and so having that power over legal education, which is the first step into the door of the profession, is a very, is a very big power to have. Okay, so let's start to get into this because I mentioned this idea of accreditation, but um, if you want to be a lawyer, before you can start practicing law, you have to go to law school. That's and right. so I'm sure probably most of us have some acquaintance or, or some uh, relative who, who's been to law school. Uh, you've, you've been to law school, my wife went to law school, so some of us are more familiar yeah. with some of the details. But if you've only if you're not very familiar, you might not be sure you're clear of exactly what's involved with going to law school. So what, what's involved in, in the uh, legal education process here? Well, legal education takes three years of work. Mm -hmm. um, you have your sort of formative 1L curriculum in which you learn property and contracts and constitutional law and basic subject matter. And uh, then in your second year, you'll still get some essential, what I would call core subjects, evidence. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and maybe a secondary constitutional law class, maybe a class on the First Amendment, something like that. Um, but then by your third year, you are taking a lot more electives. And mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a legitimate case to be made that the third year of law school is too much, that, uh, that students are spending too much time learning things that don't prepare them to be actual lawyers out in the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Right now, the job market remains somewhat stagnant. It's a tough market out there for recent law school graduates. And uh, part of the reason is that big law firms, even mid-sized law firms, are finding that their recent law grads, no matter which law schools they go to, from the top-ranked schools to the bottom-ranked schools, are just not prepared to do the everyday tasks that lawyers do. Um, I can recall seeing uh, new associates in, in law firms that would come in and they would have to ask all the paralegals, how do I do this? And the mm -hmm. paralegals would, would say, this is how you do it, which really does show that the apprenticeship model does have a lot to offer it because mm -hmm. students are actually learning under the direction of experienced attorneys, number one. And number two, they're actually using the skills, uh, and learning the skills that they're going to use throughout their professional career. Um, and uh, law schools are doing certain things to try to remedy that and they're uh, instituting clinical work and uh, and other types of programs, but uh, I do think it's still a deficiency in legal education that needs to be remedied. All right, so you, you go to law school for three years, and, and maybe you have to be taking out a lot of loans to, to rack up a lot of debt pursuing law school. You you go through the paper chase. That's right. And if you're successful, if you handle all these, especially the very taxing first year classes you graduate, you get your law degree, but you're not quite ready to start practicing law yet, right? There's another step. That's correct. Next, you've got to take the bar exam. And the bar exam is that prerequisite before you, uh, before you can take the bar. So every state uh, administers a different bar exam. I mean, the, the trend is moving toward a uniform bar exam mm -hmm. nationally, but uh, every state controls its own admission into the practice of the bar. Mm -hmm. So in order to um, become a member of the bar in a particular state, you have either have to pa pass that state's bar exam or have some sort of reci reciprocity agreement with another state that would enable you to waive into mm -hmm. the state's bar. And typically, you would have to go to an ABA-accredited law school if you were to want to waive into another bar or, for that matter, sit for a bar exam, to even take mm -hmm. a bar exam in, a, in, in another state. You'd have to go to an ABA-accredited law school. Okay. And if you succeed in passing the bar exam, then you can get admitted to the bar, as you mentioned. And, and uh, that's the f actual form of occupational licensing for lawyers, right? Correct. That's correct. And what exactly, because even if you can't pass the bar exam, um, what exactly is involved with being a member of the bar? And what, what are you allowed to do that you couldn't otherwise? Because at some level, I mean, we're all probably all familiar from TV dramas or where in, in, in uh, criminal cases, somebody's going to represent themselves. And you do right. have that right to represent yourself. 
so what exactly do you have to have this be a member of, of the, the legal bar to be able to do in court cases? Okay, well one thing that's unique about the legal profession is that unlike other professions that maintain these occupational licensure schemes and that are self-regulating, the legal community sort of regulates every conceivable zone of human activity because mm -hmm. laws and institutions fall over all human behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so a, a lawyer um, a lawyer who passes the bar can then represent clients. Okay. You can you know represent clients in, in any sort of um, any sort of context, whether it's drafting wills, contracts, appearing in court. But what makes the legal the legal community unique is that there's unauthorized practice of law. And so the legal community can regulate who is practicing law and who isn't. It can define those parameters. Mm -hmm. So a company like LegalZoom that's trying to go in and make legal services cheap and quick and uh, expand access to basic legal services can be deemed to be uh, participating in the unauthorized practice of law. And mm -hmm. so the legal community can thereby exclude those, those forms of competition. So really, um, the bar exam makes sure that there's a monopoly on legal services and that anti-competitive practices get enshrined in our institutions and our laws. And, and so it's really sort of like the representation of other uh, individuals in court that, that's at the heart of this uh, monopoly? It could be in court and it could be outside of court. It, okay. could, be in, um, it could be just in interactions between businesses. Uh, Lysander Spooner, a 19th century libertarian philosopher, believed that uh, that legislating these um, barriers to entry for lawyers was an infringement on the freedom of contract because he thought, hey, if, if you and I want to contract with each other, you know a lot more about the law than I do. Um, so I want to say, hey, Dan, why don't, can you help me with this contract? Mm -hmm. Can you help me? Because you're good at that. Then we should be able to do that. We should mm -hmm. be able to have that freedom. But these legislative impositions prevent us from having that voluntary transaction and from having what really would be mutually beneficial exchange for, for both of us. Um, so I think that's, that's one major problem with, uh, with bar exams and licensure on sort of a philosophical level. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then we said that there are requirements for sitting for this bar examination, thus, and if you can pass the bar exam, is there, there are some other things you have to do to be able to, to become a member of the bar. There's like a, a background check and some other things. Yeah. But basically, you have to pass the bar exam, but then you have to also be legally able to sit for the bar exam. And that's where the accreditation story comes into this, right? Because you've hinted at this. Uh, this idea that you have to, in some states, you have to attend an ABA accredited law school to be able to sit for the uh, bar exam. So we've used this term accreditation, but I think we should probably explain it a little bit more because it is something that occurs a lot in higher education, but if you're not involved in higher education, you're probably not familiar with it. So what is this, uh, what do we mean by accreditation in higher education? Okay, accreditation is basically permission to, uh, or it's a, it's a certification, it's a form mm -hmm. of authorization that shows a stamp of government approval, in this case, the Department of Education with the ABA. So just to back up a minute, explain what the ABA is. The ABA is a nonprofit organization incorporated in Illinois that operates as a trade union for lawyers, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, mo more to the benefit of law professors than, than lawyers, actually, but that's the theory behind it. Now, since 1952, the ABA has enjoyed um, accreditation and powers from the, uh, authorized by the Department of Education. And uh, it's actually kind of, there, there's kind of an ugly history behind the ABA's um, barrier to entry, which is that um, when the ABA was first formed by sort of an elite fraternity of men on the East Coast, it was formed to prevent low-income people from entering into the legal profession, mm -hmm. um, and in particular ethnic minorities from entering into the legal profession. In fact, in 1912, it came out that three African Americans had become members of the ABA, and uh, several members of the ABA panicked and they ousted those three members, prompting protests by the NAACP and uh, in fact that same year the ABA passed a resolution 
stating that it was never contemplated that our organization would admit members of the colored race or something to that effect. And for 66 years, 66 years, the ABA excluded black people from uh, membership. Now, since then, of course, the ABA has done all kinds of things to promote diversity and uh, um, champion um, uh, d different forms of diversity, both racial, gender, sexual orientation, all these kinds of things. But I think you can't turn something that by its very function is to exclude people mm -hmm. into something else. So a lot of the ABA uh, accreditation standards and even bar examinations, which are administered by state bar associations, have the uh, disproportionate effect on ethnic minorities, mm -hmm. on low-income people, on people that are really trying to to dig themselves out of poverty or change their circumstances. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's really unfortunate um, that we have we haven't invested so much power in these in these institutions. So you think of of the. 250 or so law schools in the country, if I think I remember correctly, there's about 206 of them are, are actually accredited mm -hmm. by the American Bar Association. So how is it that, and I think there's around 15 or so states where you have to actually graduate from a ABA accredited uh, law school to be able to sit for the bar exam. How would a provision like that get imposed? Okay, I, that's a really important point because it shows the distinction between what the ABA is Mm -hmm. and what a state bar association okay. is. So what a state bar association is, is a corporation that the legislature has granted monopoly powers over the practice of law, and that is superintended by state supreme courts. Mm -hmm. So it is the state bar association and the state supreme court that together determine who is and who is not eligible to sit for the bar exam. And typically, that requirement will be that you must graduate from an ABA accredited law school. In fact, all states recognize ABA accreditation mm -hmm. and will let you sit for their bar if you pass, I mean, if you uh, graduate from an ABA accredited law school. Now here in Alabama, we have two non-ABA accredited schools, um, Miles and Birmingham, and you can sit for the bar in Alabama if you graduate mm -hmm. from one of those schools. And a lot of schools have this. California has probably 20 something unaccredited law schools that will enable you to sit for a bar exam in the state of California, mm -hmm. but you won't get that reciprocity, um, you won't get that reciprocity that would allow you to practice law in another state or to even sit for a bar exam in another state, typically. So and just to be clear, the, this uh, accreditation function means the, a, the ABA doesn't run any of these um, law Correct. schools, right? They, they are run by, they, I guess they're, uh, most are affiliated with the university, but it, it, as we were talking earlier, they're, they're actually in, independent of, of the universities, right? Yeah, well, yeah, governance from law schools is, is autonomous um, from, from universities to a large extent, because of, um, largely because of um, okay. ABA okay. regulations. Okay, and the, the ABA doesn't have a, a complete monopoly over the ability of anybody to open a law school. We do have these non-accredited, non-ABA accredited, non -ABA accredited uh, law schools. So it's not like they have, like, they can ban somebody from organizing a law school. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. So we have this combination of, it, it, it's sort of really like the, the combination of the, the law school or, or the occupational licensing and the accreditation that's giving the, the ABA some power. But if we think about this for a second, wouldn't there have to be something like this, a, a whole accreditation and licensing process, even if we didn't have <laughs> you know, our current system as it is? Because if I was running a law firm and I was looking to hire somebody to work with clients and you came to me and, and applied for the job and said you had knowledge of the law, I probably wouldn't want to take your word for it. Right, I'd probably right. going to see some evidence that you had, you know, and even if you went to say uh, some law school, we'd, I'd want to have some assurance that they were actually teaching the law there at your uh, the, the law school you went to, as opposed to you know our students have run-ins with the law, so they're very knowledgeable <laughs> about the law, right? So there would have to be something similar to what we're, we see going on here, even if there was a complete market with no none of this uh, licensing involved, right? Yeah. So let's pretend that the ABA did not have a crediting powers, and mm -hmm. let's pretend that there were no bar associations that enforce these barriers to entry. 
and let's even assume that there were no bar exams, still there would probably be some form of law school, mm -hmm. um, some form of legal education because there has to be a, a method for, as you say, testing people's skills. Now it could be, as I mentioned earlier, the apprenticeship, apprenticeship model. That mm -hmm. could be a viable model as well. But this idea that if you were to take all those things away, there wouldn't be law schools, I think is false. I think the biggest law firms would still hire from Harvard and Yale and Chicago and Stanford. You know, you would still have ways of distinguishing ability um, that were separate from what we just talked about. And with the bar exam in particular, the bar exam doesn't test how to practice law. It doesn't test mm -hmm. practical skills. So by removing the bar exam, taking the bar exam out of the picture, you would have no measurable effect on basic skills, basic you know, talent that it takes to, to practice the bar, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, to, to practice law. Um, you know, I think this is an important point to get into because it, it's closely related to the issue you raised about the cost of law school. And that is when you're talking about, uh, when you're talking about trying to verify the quality of any type of education or, or training or, or, or skills and so forth, uh, higher quality always involves higher costs. The right. more training, you're, you know, the more time people, somebody's going to take to train or learn about the law, the more costly it's going to be. And there's always got to be a trade-off between the value of the quality of training and the cost that's, that's imposed right. there. But there can be a lot of elements of the training that aren't actually adding a lot of value to it, right? I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, I think. Um, I think one thing about ABA regulations, I mentioned earlier that it forces costs to reallocate, it forces law schools to reallocate resources toward a lot of things that drive up the costs of legal education. Mm -hmm. And these are costs that eventually get passed on to consumers because, um, because just, just the, the extraordinary, uh, the extraordinary amount of fees that are involved and in, in all these, that law firms are having to, to dig their associates out of, out of debt and they're having mm -hmm. to, um, and the, the students themselves are having to dig their way out of debt. And, and of course, that only incentivizes tightening those barriers to entry and controlling who can come in and who can, who can come out because then you can ensure that you can keep those prices high so that you're trying to pay off, but it's a vicious cycle because the more you do that, the more the mm -hmm. law schools are able to, the law schools and the ABA are keeping the, the prices keep going up and everything just keeps going up. And this is all coming at the expense of just the everyday consumer um, who can't afford um, basic legal, legal services. And, and one thing you suggest is the possibility that you, know, you could easily have perhaps a two year, uh, yeah, maybe law school so. only had to be two years, possibly even just one year if you wanted to uh, focus more in, uh, on the, the train, on maybe more, move to more of an apprentice-based system where one year would be in law school and then a, a, a apprentice after that. So if we get into this then, like when you look at the, that third year of law school, you mentioned before, but maybe we get into some more of the details, mm -hmm. that a lot of the classes in the third year of law school aren't very closely related to the actual practice of law. Right? That's true, and I've, I've actually always thought that it would be neat to do something like what medical schools do, where they have an MD, PhD track. Mm -hmm. And say you want to be a practitioner, you go out and you get what used to be an LLB, the, the law degrees used to be an LLB, mm -hmm. and you could go out and you could do that, let's say it was a year and a half of school, and then you could go out in some sort of apprenticeship model um, that would maybe even take the place of the bar exam. And uh, then there would be a separate track for people that wanted to be academics, for people who wanted to research the history of law or the philosophies of law, jurisprudence, or focus on constitutional law and appellate work those people could go on the JD track. It would be like that, that MD-PhD distinction, but in the law it could be an LLB-JD distinction. So that there are people who have an academic curiosity and an academic interest in the law, and there can be a track for those people. Mm -hmm. And they can go on to be law professors or faculty in whatever department might have an interest in uh, legal-related analysis. 
But then all the people that just want to go out and be practicing lawyers who don't want to deal with all those theoretical courses and don't want to take the writing requirement where you have to write a law review length piece and all, they can go and take the courses they need to take in order to get out and start filing lawsuits and start handling cases and start helping the needs of people that, mm -hmm. that have those needs. And again, to get into some of the, the, the detail, or a couple more details sure. here of this. Um, you mentioned the, the fact that in law school you don't necessarily learn a lot about how to actually do some of these mechanical mm -hmm. things. The case of a, the, the lawyer, the law school graduate who's passed the bar exam, but they have to ask the paralegal who, right. who is not, who's never been to law school how to actually do things like write a brief or, or file a, 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 you know file some documents, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah, I mean there's a long learning curve. Because what you're essentially doing in law school is you're delaying people's lives three years. You're delaying, mm -hmm. delaying their, their job, their occupation, three years. And then once they enter, assuming they've passed the bar exam and they've gone through that hurdle, then they've got another three years of a learning curve. So it will take basically six years for somebody to get comfortable in their own shoes practicing law. And that's just so long. And uh, it could be shortened, and it, it would really help both prospective lawyers and, and young attorneys, and I think uh, society generally, to have people more equipped earlier mm -hmm. rather than just delaying and, um, and essentially forcing out a lot of people that would want to go to law school. I mean, mm -hmm. there are people that, that just don't have uh, the money and the income and they haven't they don't have people that can support them and help them get through three years of law school mm -hmm. and uh, and so you're you're not just excluding people through all these you know all these hurdles that we talked about the bar exam and all these things but you're excluding them based on just financial means alone now we've been talking about the two issues of accreditation and then occupational licensing. Mm -hmm. And to make the point that it's the two in combination that are, are leading to a lot of things here, uh, you offered a, in, in something you wrote recently and some examples from journalism accreditation where there is no occupational licensing and, and uh, some of, a couple of the leading uh, journalism schools in the country actually have recently dropped their specialized accreditation, right? That's right, yeah. Northwestern and Berkeley both just dropped their accreditors and said, mm -hmm. you know what, it's, it, this is not worth it to us. It costs too much money to comply with all these regulations which are archaic for our field and we don't need it. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we're Berkeley and Northwestern. You know, what, what are, are people going to devalue our degree because we didn't get accredited? No, let's just let's just forget this accreditation stuff. And I've actually encouraged leading law schools to do the same thing. The difference is is that because we have all these state requirements established by the state bar associations, uh, bar associations and state supreme courts that require you to graduate from an ABA accredited law school in order to sit for the bar. Um, you know, it makes it a lot, it disincentivizes big schools from doing something like that. However, we could try to encourage state bar associations and state um, and, and state supreme courts to look into this a little more and start considering, well, mm -hmm. maybe if, if several states got the idea that we don't need this ABA accreditation or that this ABA accreditation is harmful, um, maybe we could start pushing back in that form. Well, and just to wrap up, I want to mention one other thing that this was, uh, that this whole element of accreditation is affecting, that's uh, individuals who've been who've learned the law in other countries and I mean to come here in the United States they can find it difficult to start practicing here right? absolutely there is a law school in South Korea called Hang, Handong Law School and for a time their graduates could sit for the Alabama bar and they can no longer sit for that bar but there are some uh, very capable uh, graduates of that school who are practicing law in Alabama and doing very well and uh, in fact there's there's one in particular, attorney at Beasley Allen Law Firm, who does a great job. He's very well known, very kind person, and prominent member of the bar. And so the students graduating from these law schools are very able. They were, they're the kinds of lawyers that we would want to be members of our bar, but they're unable to. Well, thanks very much for coming on and talking about this. Thank today. you, Dan. And thanks for joining us. So join us again next time for another eConversations.